Hey, Super Duper Gamer here, and today I'm playing Charterstone. This is a village building legacy game designed by Janie, Janie Stegmeier from Stonemeyer Games. Now this video is going to be a little different because as you can see, I haven't opened the game yet. Usually I like to play the game quite a few times before making my video so I know what I'm talking about. But this game being a legacy game has spoilers. The game changes as you play it. So if I played it three times and then showed you what it looks like on game four, it would be a spoiler. It'd be something you don't want to see until you get yourself to game four. So you're going to experience game one with me to keep this as spoiler free as possible. Now we will be opening the game and looking at what's inside the box. And if you consider that a spoiler, don't watch this video. The only thing I know about this game, other than what it says on the box, is that it's rated pretty well. Um, and that's not surprising, being from Stonemeyer Games. Uh, I have faith it's going to be a good game because this company has built a good reputation for themselves with Scythe and Viticulture. Well, let's open up the game and let's play. Alright, we've got, let's see, a Chronicle. Not sure what that's going to be. An Automa. We'll be using that. And a bunch of boxes that hopefully the rule book will tell us when to open what and what we need. Okay, the Chronicle is the thing on the top of the box. Perhaps I should have taken a look at it before just tossing it aside. Um, but I didn't actually open any of the boxes inside there, so that's alright. It says here, please read this page before looking at anything else in this box. And then it tells you to only open exactly what you are told to open and don't look ahead at anything else. All right, so step one for getting into our game of Charterstone is to take the shrink wrap off all the cards in the index box. So go ahead and pull that out. Now it says when you're doing this, be careful not to look at the cards and don't shuffle them. They, are, they need to be in the same order. So we'll get to work on unwrapping these. Step two, read through the crowns. It's not necessary to learn any rules before Charterstone's first game. Now here's the key for this video. When one to six players have been gathered for the first game, we have just me, we have one player. So a lot of games claim to be one player compatible. We'll see how this one does. Extract the first card in the box, in the index, card number one, and read the card out loud. Okay, so if you don't wanna know what card one says, then you could. this could be considered a spoiler. But this is the very first thing I have to do in the game. There's no way for me to make a video of this game without reading card one. Arrival, story one. The immortal Forever King has selected six citizens of Green Gully to start a new village far from the Eternal City. Congratulations for being chosen. Your goal is to bring the greatest glory to the Forever King so you may rule the village in his name. After spending all day flying over the kingdom, the Zeppelin sets down and the guards open the hatch for you and your companions. Unfold the game board either side and put the objective mat and advancement mat next to the board. Locate and open the chronicle, the rulebook, peel the sticker off this card and affix it to the indicated space on page 6. Then place the card remnant in the archive. You will do this for all story and rule cards. Extract card 2 from the index. Okay, so that had quite a few instructions. First was to get the board out, right? Okay, here's the board. It also says... The objective mat and advancement mat. All right, I think these are the advancement mat and objective mat because they're the only other things that came in the box. Um, so I'm just gonna put those there for now. It also says to peel this sticker off and affix it to the rule book on page six. And then place this card in the archive. I find a little tuck box that says archive on it. And if we open up our chronicle to page six as instructed, we've got a block here that says story one. So really easy. On this card, on the top left, it says story one. Clearly, this sticker goes there. And then this, honestly, this just looks like trash, but it says to put it in the archive box. So we'll do that. And at the bottom here, it says extract card two from the index. Pull card two. 
which is just going to be the next one because they're all in order. Scriptorium and General Supply, Story 2. The sun is setting as you venture outside. The location is a lush landscape of rolling hills, patches of green, and a babbling brook. The guards unload a number of mysterious crates and forbid you to open any of them except for the one labeled Scriptorium. Open it now. The Scriptorium tux Tuck Box is where you'll store global components from game to game. During the game, these global components, along with advancement cards, form the general supply, and they are all limited as follows. We find the scriptorium, and then extract card three from the index. It doesn't say to put the sticker there, but it seems pretty obvious. So I'm gonna go ahead and put the sticker there. So it did say to open the scriptorium. Card 3, Charter Selection, Story 3. The group gathers around a large rock. You recognize it as a charter stone, just like the one at the center of the Eternal City. The village is divided into six charters, each with six hexagonal plots. Each player should now adjust their seating position to permanently select their charter. Claim your charter chest, the box with your charter emblem. The text on it will be explained later. Then open it to reveal these components. Two regular workers, one big, one small, one victory point token, and 12 influence tokens. Extract cards 200 to 205 from the index and match them with each player. For each inactive player, place their Persona card in the Charter Chest. Each player names their Persona right on the card. This is who you are for the campaign. Extract card 4 from the index. Alright, so again, I'm going to go ahead and put my Story 3 sticker down in the rule book. Okay, so it says I need to choose my Charter. It says the board is divided into 6 Charters. Yep, those are pretty easy to see. We've got blue, red, purple, green, yellow, and gray. So, uh, there's a couple ways I can decide to do this. I can pick my favorite color. I could pick whatever's most convenient for the camera angle. Actually, this one up here looks like it's got a diving board on the side of a cliff. I think that looks pretty exciting. That's going to be my charter right there. So I'll be that red one. So I need to take my box, my charter chest from the, from the game box, pull it out, open it up to reveal. Let's see, hopefully everything it said. Yep, two regular workers, one big, one small, one victory point token, and 12 influence tokens. Three, six, nine, 12. Yep, got everything there. And clearly this box needs to be kept. It's got spaces to mark stuff on, it looks like. So that's mine. That'll be my charter right there. Next, extract cards 200 to 205 from the index and match them with each player. And for each inactive charter, place their Persona card in their charter chest. So these are the personas that actually go with the charters then. Each player names a persona right on the card. This is who you are for the campaign. All right, so that's my persona. And these are inactive charters, so they will go in their charter chest. Actually, they're not gonna be inactive. They are going to be set up as automobs. Okay, naming my persona. I think I'm gonna call this guy Soup Dupe. And I've decided to have two Automas join me in this game, so that will be the blue and the gray players down here. And the other three Personas are going to go away in their respective Charter chest. And the last thing Index Card 3 said to do was to extract Index Card 4. Basic resource buildings. When the guards leave, you scout your charter for your first charter building. The village will rely on access to basic resources to survive, grow, and prosper. Extract cards 5 through 10 from the index and give each player the card that matches their charter. Set aside cards for inactive charters for a moment. These cards will feature basic resource buildings where players will place workers to gain one of the indicated resource. Each player removes the building sticker from the corresponding card and fixes it permanently at any plot in their charter. Buildings must be oriented in the same way as all other buildings on the board. Each player keeps their constructed building card face up in front of them as they'll need it later. Extract card 11 from the index. So we're going to pull 5 through 10, do that, and then 11. Alright, here's cards 5 through 10, your basic starting resource cards. So we've got I am red, we have blue and gray out here. So these three are inactive charters. We're going to set those aside for the moment. And these will place the building in the start in the charters. So as the red charter, my starting building is the clay pit. All right, there's the clay pit. And then I will take the constructed building card and I will keep it. The automas, though, they do not keep their constructed building cards. 
And then their constructed building card is going to go here in the advancement deck discard pile. And Bertha will build the mine. Now index card 11. For fewer than six players, that's us, we only have three. Story five. Regardless of the number of human players in any given game of Charterstone, there are always six founding villagers, each operating a different charter. A charter not controlled by players called an inactive charter. We have three of those. But it is still very much a part of the growing village. If there are fewer than six players, affix each remaining building sticker to a plot in the indicated inactive charters. Place the constructed building card on the advancement mat for now. On the advancement mat, so not in the discard pile. The game will soon introduce a way for inactive charters to grow, but if at any time you would like these charters to act like human players, please read and use the Automa rulebook. Yep, we're doing that with two of them. Okay, this is necessary for solo games, but we recommend that two or more player games only consider Automa game Automa after game one or two, not now. So for solo, we have to use the Automa in game one. Okay, now index card 12. Extract cards 206 through 218 from the index. Place the eight assistant cards on the advancement mat and the five objective cards on the objective mat. You will soon shuffle the cards on each of the mats into their respective decks. Open the chronicle and proceed with the set of instructions. Then for players who haven't read the rules in advance, explain a player turn, which is rule 15, the building in the the Building Summon Commons, Rule 17, The Cloud Port, Rule 22, and The Reputation Track, Rule 23. When you're ready to begin Game 1, extract card 13 from the index, place this card in the archive without removing the sticker. Okay, it's going straight to the archive. Alright, cards 206 through 218. See that a lot of them have the advancement back, and some of them have the objective back. So we'll place those on their respective mats here. I used the Automa rulebook to find the Automa deck in the index, pulled it out, and shuffled it. We'll be needing that. So to complete setup, we just shuffled the advancement deck and laid out s some advancement cards on the advancement mat. And same thing with the objective deck, laid out three objectives. We put our victory point tokens at the start of the victory point track. All right, each player has two workers and 12 influence tokens. The automas don't have their unconstructed building card. Those went in the advancement deck. Me, however, I do have my constructed building card and I also received $4 to start the game with. The only things left to do are put the progress token on the correct spot. We're playing with three players, so we'll go ahead and start right here on the 3P. And then we need to choose who is going to be first player. We'll do that by rolling the Charter Stone die. All right, blue, that is Gladys. She is in this game, so she will be player one. Okay, before we jump into the game, some important things I just learned from reading the rule book. When you take your turn, you either place one of your workers on a building on the board, or retrieve, if your workers are already out here, your turn, your whole turn, could be just to retrieve all your workers from the board. If someone else already has a worker somewhere and you want to go there, when you, you can, and as soon as you do, it bumps that worker back to their supply. Alright, so let's go over what the starting positions are on the board. In the middle we've got the commons. You can go to the zeppelin, it'll take three influence tokens plus four resources to build a building and gain five victory points. The charter stone takes two influence tokens and four dollars to open a crate and gain five, five victory points. The grandstand takes one influence token to complete an objective and gain five victory points, but you have to already have met the requirements of that objective to do that. The treasury, you can trade in one resource of any type for one dollar, and at the market you can Spend a dollar and a resource to gain an advancement card. All these basic buildings that each charter started with have no cost to go to them and they produce one resource. So if you send your worker here, you don't pay anything and you would collect one coal. Alright, the last starting space out here is the cloud port. If you send a worker here, it's going to cost you one influence token and you get to use the quota and collect three victory points. Now the influence token, you actually put it somewhere here on the quota either one, two, or three, and so that's gonna cost you one, two, or three goods, dollars, or advancement cards. And if you go here, you get an extra victory point. If you go here, you get to put uh, an influence token on the reputation track. So going here would cost three advancement cards. You would get three victory points, and you would get to put an influence token on the reputation track. The first token we put on the reputation track will go here in 3P and all the future tokens will get, because we have three players, and all future tokens will get added this direction until it's filled up and then no more tokens can be added. 
And at the end of the game, whoever has the most tokens on the reputation track will get 10 points, second most 7, and third most 4. The last thing we need to look at before we start playing is the progress track. So we take the progress token and put it on the three player spot. And as it, through the game, this will move along, and once it gets to the last spot, the game is over. So it will move forward whenever someone builds a building, opens a crate, or completes an objective. Additionally, if you have no influence tokens left at the beginning of your turn, you must move the progress token forward. When you move it onto one of these spots that has the reputation icon, you may add one of your influence tokens to the reputation track. This is the income symbol and it's not used yet for game one. And now that we've read the rulebook and completed setup, we're ready to begin the game by extracting card 13 from the index. All right, card 13 will tell us that an important part of game one is for each player to use the charter stone building. This will let you unlock the crate shown on your constructed building card. Review the steps on rule 19 the first time this happens in game one. Now begin the game. Set this card aside and refer to it the first time a player unlocks a crate. After the first crate is unlocked, extract card 14 from the index. Place this card in the archive without removing the sticker. All right. As we rolled the die and Gladys won the roll, she will be first player. So for the Anima turn, if they have a worker available, which she does, they will draw one Anima card, place the worker, gain victory points, gain benefits, and then discard the Anima card. If they don't have any workers available, their turn will be just to retrieve all their workers from the board and we'll move on to the next player. Gladys does have workers, so we're going to draw our first Anima card and see what we've got here. Alright, this indicates which charter to use. So Gladys will roll the charter stone die to decide which charter to go to, and then she will select the lowest valued building in that charter. However, we only have one building in each charter. If there was a tie for lowest valued building, she would select the one that comes first going backwards alphabetically. Okay, she hit the red charter. So here we have the red charter, the clay pit. So Gladys will put a worker in the clay pit. But the Ottoman actually does not get any benefits printed on the building, so we don't have to worry about giving her a piece of clay. What we do have to do is give her victory points based on the current Ottoman strength. For game one, that will be one. So Blue takes an early lead with one victory point. And that's it for the Ottoman turn, so we'll move on to Soup Dupe. Okay, so now it is my turn as Soup Dupe. Uh, there's kind of two things I feel like I should be doing right now. One is to open a crate because that's it says that's an important part of game one, which I could do right now. Opening a crate costs two influence tokens and four dollars, which I have. The other thing I think I should be doing is maybe working towards completing well, one of the objectives. So let's take a look at those. All right, the three objectives we've drawn for our game are have at least three influence tokens on the reputation track, or have at least two assistant cards, or have at least one of each resource. So you gain assistance by getting them from the advancement mat, and you take advancement cards from the market. So I need one gold and one resource of any type. I don't have any resources yet. I do have uh, gold, so I will work on getting resources. I guess I'll just go anywhere to get any resource. So I'll go to the cave and collect one metal from the general supply. And that's the end of my turn. So Bertha goes. It's an Automa, so she'll draw an Automa card. Okay, again we see we're rolling the charter stone die to select which charter, and then she will go with the lowest valued building. There's only one building, and she will collect victory points equal to the Automa strength, which for game one is one. So let's see where she will go. Boy. Purple. So she's going to uh, the garden here, and she will collect one victory point. Okay, I feel like I'm behind now. Alright, back to Gladys. Let's see what she wants to do. Um, same thing. Roll the charter stone die, collect uh, one victory point. Purple. So Gladys will actually bump Bertha's worker off, which gives Bertha the ability to go again some sooner instead of having to waste a turn collecting her workers off the board. So Gladys gets a point for that. But now on Gladys' next turn, she doesn't have any workers. If one of, if one of those gets bumped off, she'll be able to play, but if not, she'll have to waste a turn collecting her workers off the board. Now back to me, and now I do have a resource, so I'm going to go ahead and send my worker to the market. Now it costs me one gold and one resource of any type, so I'm going to spend one dollar and one metal, return those to the general supply. And then I will collect uh, an advancement card. I'm going to take this one. Okay, so this says Assistant Sherpa. Whenever 
you advance the progress token, gain one victory point. And if you have an unnamed assistant in your possession, you get to go ahead and name them. This Sherpa man from now on will be Babu. And I'll just go ahead and stash him over here in my player area. So I've got one crate to open and I've got one assistant. Now move now back to Bertha, draw an Automa card for her. Now this is different. She's going to do something in the commons, and then she will get victory points equal to Anma strength, which is one, and then she will discard two, the two highest valued cards off the advancement track. This building, you just match the picture and you see that it is actually the market, which is really good for me because now I'll have a worker to do something next time. So Bertha puts a worker on the market, bumping mine off. She collects one victory point. And then she discards the two highest valued cards from the advancement map. Okay, so actually on my turn, as soon as I took this card, we were supposed to replace it. Okay, now the two highest valued cards refers to the numbers in the bottom right. So this assistant is number 213. That's going off. And then these are basically all the same, but this one's actually the highest value with number 10. So he's going off. And then they immediately get replaced from the deck. Okay, back to Gladys. Now Gladys doesn't have any workers. Her workers are still out on the board. So her whole turn will just be to collect her workers from the board. And now it's back to me. So in order to utilize my Babu, I need to advance progress track. This is done by building a building, opening a crate, or completing an objective. In order to complete this objective, I need to have at least two assistant cards. So I can either work on opening a crate or getting another assistant. In order to open a crate, I actually need four dollars and I only have three so the way I see right now to get more money is to just um, collect the resource and then sell it at the treasury so either way whether I'm going for an assistant or opening a crate what I need right now is another resource so I'm gonna go ahead and put my worker on the mine and take a coal from the general supply okay for Bertha we have to draw a new Automa card and here this means on her own charter she will do the lowest valued building, going backwards alphabetically if there's a tie, and she will collect two victory points. So Bertha is black. Her charter is here with the mine. Now this is going well for me. So she'll bump my worker off and collect two victory points. Now Gladys has workers, so she gets to take a turn. She's going to the charter stone. She is going to open a crate. So she's going to put a worker on the charter stone. Then she will collect two victory points, open a crate, and advance the progress track. So she's going to move up from two to four victory points. Uh, it seems kind of weird that I still have zero and they're both on four. Okay, but now she needs to open a crate. So we go back to our index card 13. We read the steps on rule 19 the first time this happens. Okay, from the Automa rules, we see that we're going to actually unlock the crate on the lowest numbered constructed building card on the advancement mat and follow the index guide. Okay, and from rule 19, we see that we need to refer to the index guide to determine the components to extract. Uh, gain the indicated victory points, which is five on the charter stone. That's actually not going to happen because the Automas don't get the rewards listed on the buildings on the board. Advance the progress token, that is happening because the Automa card specifically said to do it. And place the constructed building card in the archive. Okay, personas, from the Automa rulebook, personas will just go in our Automa's charter stone ch charter chest, which is actually what it says here anyway. So we look at our advancement mat and we find the lowest valued one is five right here, so this is the garden. And so she will be opening crate number one. And this constructed building card is going into the archive. Now looking at the lid of our index box, we see that crate one says gain 22, 23, and 219. Okay, so crate one had cards 22, 23, and 219. 219 is a persona card, so it will be going in Gladys's charter chest. And 22 and 23 are advancement cards, so they'll be going in the discard pile of the advancement deck. Now these are actually um, construction cards. These are buildings that can be built and added to your charter area. And then the final thing listed on her Automa card was to advance the progress track. Now it's back to my turn. I have one coal and three dollars. I need four dollars to open a crate, so I can't do that. Okay, but I could spend one dollar and one resource of any type to gain an advancement card. I think I'll go ahead and do 
that. Now I do have to bump Bertha off, but I will spend one coal and one dollar to grab another assistant. Now I have two assistants, but I don't actually complete the objective until I specifically go to the grandstand to complete an objective. This new assistant I just purchased is an engineer, and he says whenever you use the Zeppelin, gain plus two victory points. The Zeppelin is what you use to construct new buildings, so hopefully I'll be using that. Okay, we have to name our new assistant, so I'll call him Gary and add him to my player area. Now is my turn, Bertha draws an Automa card. Here we see she will be going to her own charter and using the highest valued building and collecting two victory points. In this case, she'll actually just bump herself off, I guess, and collect two victory points. She's all the way up to six and I'm still at zero. Okay, uh, looks like we forgot to do this earlier, okay. After the first grade is unlocked, extract card 14 from the index. Place this card in the archive without removing the sticker. Card 14, constructing a building. Rule 18, because of their mobility and flexibility, Zeppelins are the standard way of constructing buildings in Green Goalie. You may place a worker on the Zeppelin to construct a building on an empty plot in your charter using a building card from your personal supply. Cost, pay three influence tokens plus the four resources shown on the upper left of a building card. Remove the building sticker and permanently affix it to an empty plot in your charter. Gain five victory points and advance the progress token. If the constructed building card shows a crate, place it face up in your personal supply. Otherwise, place it in the archive. The number shown below the building is its victory point value at the end of the campaign. Extract card 15 from the index. So we're going to go ahead and put this in the rule book. Okay, card 15. Persona cards, rule 5. You're discovering that you have a variety of skills that you don't remember learning. The Forever King seems to be happy each time you use a different persona. All persona cards, except the original personas, give each player a special ability. During setup, you may select any persona from your charter chest. Keep it face up, you may use its ability throughout the game. Each marked persona is worth 5 to 7 victory points at the end of the campaign. You will be told to mark your selected persona at the end of the game if you used it. If you unlock a persona card during a game, place it in your charter chest even if it doesn't look like your original persona. You can't use it this game. Keep all persona cards from game to game. Okay, so that's how you use those and that's why they go in your charter chest as soon as you find them from unlocking a crate. So that was rule 5, we'll put that in our rule book. Okay, card 16. Continue playing until the progress token advances to the timer space. Finish the round so all players have taken the same number of turns. Remember that if you run out of influence tokens during the game, you must advance the progress token at the beginning of your turn. Players will carry over all components in their personal supply from game 1 to game 2. Place this card at the bottom right of the game board on the guidepost slot. Then refer to the next paragraph when the final turn is taken in game 1. Okay, so who just went? Bertha. Bertha just replaced her guy at the mine. So Gladys' is turn. Gladys needs an Anima card. She's using the Zeppelin. She'll get three victory points, build a building, and increase the progress track. Now what would happen is she would build the lowest cost building from the advancement mat, but there are no buildings out here to build. So she's not going to build any building, but she does get her three victory points, and she does advance the progress track. Now she hit a, a progress, or she hit a reputation spot, but she doesn't actually use that. And back to my turn. Now, I need to open my crate, I think. Or I could just try to complete the objective. I do need to build a building. Now, building a building is going to take a lot of resources, at least four. You see these two that got put out take two pumpkins, a metal, a coal, a grain, a wood. So I can start working on getting that stuff so I can build a building so that my Gary can get me uh, extra victory points for using the Zeppelin. And if I build a building, that would also advance the progress token, which would get me which would use my Babu to get me extra victory points. So I think I'm going to do that. But first, I have no workers. So my turn is just going to be collecting workers. Okay, Bertha has a worker, so she uses an Automa card. She's going to the Grand Stand, collecting one victory point, getting a reputation, and using the quota. So we'll put her worker here, give her a victory point, put an influence token on the reputation track, and put an influence token on the quota. Gladys has a worker, so she'll take a turn by drawing an Automa card. She's going to the Charter Stone. She gets two victory points, opens a crate, and advances the progress track. So we put her worker here, bouncing off her other worker. She gets two victory points, and advances the progress track, and she opens a crate. Uh, so 
She takes the lowest numbered crate. We've got a nine and a six, so she's gonna open this one. It is crate number two. So this goes in the archive. Check our index guide. Find that for crate two, she gets cards four, three, four, four, and two, three, three. Okay, similarly to crate one, the two lower numbered cards were buildings, and the higher numbered card was a new persona. So this is going in her charter chest, and these are going in the advancement discard deck. Now my turn, I need to collect resources. So, I mean, you look at these. Remember, we had two with two pumpkins, two with two coals. Basically, I need everything. I definitely, three of these use coal, so that'd be a good one to get, I guess. I'm gonna go ahead and start by just gathering a coal, which is where Bertha is. So, actually, I won't. <laughs> um, I'll gather a pumpkin. Now, Bertha, uh, her turn will just be to collect her workers. Gladys, she has a worker, so she'll draw an Automa card. She'll roll the die, collect one victory point. She's going in the black, which is right here, and she gets one victory point. Now my turn, I'll use my worker to collect the resource. How about a grain? Bertha will draw an Automa card. Grandstand, one victory point, one reputation, and a quota. So she puts a worker here, she gets a victory point, she gets a reputation, and she puts an influence token on the quota track. Gladys has no workers, so she collects. I have no workers, so I collect. Bertha has a worker, so she draws an Automa card. Roll the die, get one victory point. She's going on the red and she collects one victory point. Uh, Berth Gladys has workers, so she draws a card, but the Automa deck is empty, so we're gonna shuffle that. Draw an Automa card for Gladys. Uh, she's going to the Charter Stone, she gets two victory points, opens a crate, and advances the progress token. Oops, forgot to flip that. Okay, so we do have one crate out here, she'll take that and open it. This is going in the archive, and she's opening crate five. For crate five, she gets cards 89, 88, and 303. Same format again, we've got two buildings and one persona. So these are going in the advancement card discard deck, and this is going in Gladys's charter chest. And we refill the empty spot on the advancement map. And then she advances the progress track. Okay, my turn, I'm just gonna continue collecting resources. I'll go with coal. Bertha has no workers, so she will collect her workers. Gladys has a worker, so she will draw an Automa card. She's going to roll, use the second highest valued building, and collect one victory point. Yellow, yellow only has one building, so she will go there, and she will collect one victory point. Now I'll collect uh, another pumpkin. All right, Bertha. She draws a card, she's going to the grandstand, she gets one victory point, a reputation, and she'll fill a quota spot. Grandstand, one victory point, reputation, and quota. Okay, I don't think they get anything for the quota, but Bertha is taking over the reputation track, and Gladys is opening all the crates. It's interesting how they... <laughs> They both have like their specific strategies going on here. Okay, Gladys doesn't have any workers, so her turn will be to collect. I don't have any workers, my turn will be to collect. Bertha has a worker, she will draw a card. She's gonna roll and go on the highest value and collect one victory point. Um, yellow, okay, and she gets one victory point. Gladys now has workers, so she'll draw a card. She's gonna roll, go on the lowest value, and get one victory point. She'll be heading to the purple charter, which is here, the garden, and she gets one victory point. I'm still collecting resources, so I'm gonna go get a medal from here. Bertha has no workers, she will gather her workers. Gladys has a worker, she will draw an Automa card. She's going to the Charter Stone, two victory points, open a crate. Of course Gladys is opening a crate. <laughs> and advance the progress track. Wow, okay. She's going to the Charter Stone, two victory points, 
open a crate, but there are none, so she does nothing, and then advance the progress track. Okay, let's see, what resource am I missing? I don't have any clay. So I'm gonna go get a clay. One, two, three, four, five, six, there's six resources. Oh, I'm missing wood, I still, I'm still missing wood. Okay, Bertha's, Bertha's turn. Let's see what she's got. Grandstand, one victory point. Of course, Bertha's gaining more reputation. These Animas are so predictable. Grandstand, one victory point. Gain a reputation and fill a quota. Gladys will gather her workers. I will gather my workers. Bertha draws a card. She's going to the Zeppelin, three victory points, build a building and advance the progress track. Three victory points, six to 15. There's no buildings to build. She advances the progress track. Okay, I'm back. I decided to pause to check the rules online to make sure I was playing this correctly because it seems like the progress track is getting advanced pretty far when we haven't built anything on any of the charters. But this is actually correct. The Automas do advance the progress track even when they don't build anything. So uh, that was Bertha's turn. Now I'm getting kind of worried that the, the game's gonna end pretty soon because Bertha only has four influence tokens left. Once she's out, then at the beginning of her turn, every turn she'll advance the progress track and that's gonna end the game real quick. So it looks like I might not get anything built, but that's all right because don't, don't forget that all my resources will carry over into game two with me. So I'm kind of stacked right now. Um, now the thing I've been doing wrong is I've been trying to wait for those building cards to come out into the advancement map. All I need to do is open my crate and my crate's gonna have building plans in it that I get automatically. Then I don't have to wait for them to come out. I don't have to purchase them. I just have them. So I need to open this crate, but that takes $4 and I've already spent money on my, on gaining assistance. So I only have $2 left. The way for me to get more money is to use the treasury to trade in my goods, um, which I'm willing to do, but it, it's, it's right now I've got five different types of goods. If I can get six, I can complete this objective up here. And that would, that would be a way for me to get points. And also I need to go ahead and do the grandstand to complete the objective that I already have, which is have at least two assistant cards. So I need to, I think I'm going to work on completing those objectives and that's going to be my goal for game one is to try to complete both of those. So first up, we gotta do Gladys' turn. So she's got workers, she's gonna draw an Automa card. So on her own charter, uh, she'll use the least, lowest numbered structure and gain two victory points. So she's blue. She goes to the cave, there's only one structure here. And she gains two victory points, moving from 16 to 18. Now my turn. Uh, so I just need wood is all I need. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and then go to the forest and gather wood. Bertha doesn't have any workers, so she'll collect her workers. Gladys draws an Automa card. She's going to roll and go on the lowest valued building and collect uh, one victory point. She's headed to the purple charter, which is up here the garden, and she'll get one victory point. All right, now me, I've got all six resources. So what I wanna do is I wanna to go to the grandstand. So it's gonna take one influence token and I get to complete an objective and earn five victory points. So I put a worker on the grandstand, or the influence token I actually put on the objective card. Because it says have at least one of each resource, and I do, so I can complete this objective, and then I gain five victory points. There we go, I'm on the board. And down here we have a reminder that if an objective is completed, it advances the progress track. So we'll do that. This is the income symbol, which doesn't apply to game one. And make sure you're keeping track of your assistance here. I've got Babu, which says, whenever you advance the progress token, gain one victory point, which advances me from five to six victory points. All right, Bertha draws a card. She is going to the market where she will get one victory point and discard the two highest valued cards off the advancement map. So we'll put her in the market, we'll give her one victory point, and discard the two highest value cards. We've got a 211 and a 212. All right, so these two assistants get discarded, and we refresh. Okay, now we're actually out and we need one more, so this is where we actually do shuffle the advancement deck. This is what I've been waiting for. 
hoping that some of these building cards will eventually come out and I'll be able to purchase them. But at this point, it's probably easier and better for me if I just open my own crate and get my own cards. We'll see what comes out. If it's something that makes requires two pumpkins, so like I already am able to build it, I might I might just do that. And it is. Ha! Okay, two pumpkins, a grain, and a wood. I have that, and that lets you build the greenhouse where you can use one influence token to get a pumpkin and a victory point. Okay. Now once you build that in your charter, anyone can use it. It's not just yours. The only thing that you that is specific to you for being in your charter is these uh, three victory points that you'll get at the end of the game. And also you will get to have this crate in your player area where you'll be able to open it at your leisure. So that was Bertha's turn. Alright, Gladys has no workers. She's going to collect her workers. I have no workers, I'm going to collect my workers. And Bertha goes again. Okay, on her own charter, she'll use the highest valued uh, structure and get two victory points. So Gray is right here, she's going to the mine, and she gets two victory points. Gladys draws a card. She's gonna roll, take the highest structure, and one victory point. She's going to gray, so she bumps Bertha's worker back and gets one victory point. Now my turn, I have workers. Okay, so I can go to the grandstand and complete another objective. I definitely want to do that. But I also really want this card, and I think now is the time to get it because I don't want to risk uh, them bumping it off. It's number 22. Okay, it's not even one of the two highest numbered, but it is one of the two lowest numbered. Which I think was something else they would do, right? I think I've got time to build that and complete my other objective still. So first I'm gonna buy that card. So I need to go to the market. Oh wait, Bertha's at the market. I don't really wanna help her out. If I leave her there and force her to waste a turn bringing her guys back, that'll, that'll extend it. So I'm gonna go to the grandstand. Okay, so it takes one influence token. I have that, I have to put a worker on the grandstand, an influence token on the objective I'm completing, and then I complete the objective, I get five victory points, moving me up to 11. The objective, by the way, says have at least two assistant cards, which I do. And then also, I advance the progress token. And Babu says whenever I advance the progress token, gain a victory point. So that bumps me up to 12. Okay, I'm feeling a lot better about where I am on the board now. I sat at zero for a long time. Okay, up to Bertha. She needs to draw a card, but the Automo deck's empty, so we're gonna shuffle that. Okay, she's gonna roll, take the highest valued structure, and gain one victory point. She's going blue. She's going to the cave, she gets one victory point. Gladys draws a card. She's going to the Charter Stone, she gets two victory points, opens a crate, and progress track. Two victory points, opens a crate, progress track. So, Charter Stone, two victory points, opens a crate, and I'll just do it now so I don't forget, progress track. Okay, so Gladys, again, opening crates, that's what she does, uh, crate three. So this goes in the archive, and we pull out our index, and see that for crate three, she gets cards 58, 59, and 258. Okay, as usual for all these um, starting plots anyway, it's two new structures that are advancement cards and one new persona. So the persona goes in her charter chest and the structures that Automo draw go in the advancement discard pile. If it was a player, those structures would, would go straight into their player area. Okay, my turn. Now I, um, let's see, so we need to replenish the advancement deck or the advancement map. Oh, there's a new one. So this is a refinery, it's just like the greenhouse, except you get metal instead of pumpkin. But I have two, two pumpkins, so I'm gonna go ahead and try to buy and build the greenhouse. But again, I'm trying to wait till the... Right now, if I do that, it's gonna let Bertha play next turn, and I wanna kinda screw her over and make her waste a turn bringing her workers back. So I'm not gonna go to the market yet. The other thing I need to do is open this crate, which takes four dollars. So I need to work on getting more dollars, I have two, and I can do that at the treasury. So to build this greenhouse, I'm gonna need my two pumpkins, my grain, and my wood. So these are all extra resources over here. Now I need one to, to buy the advancement card, 
but then I still have two extra ones of whatever. So I'm gonna take the coal. I'm gonna go to the treasury and I'm gonna sell my coal for a dollar. Okay, Bertha's turn, she gathers her workers. Gladys' turn, she gathers her workers. My turn, I gather my workers. Bertha's turn, she draws an Automa card. She's going to the Zeppelin, she gets three points, she builds a building, and she advances the progress track. So she goes to the Zeppelin, she gets three, 19 plus three is 22. She builds a building, she builds the lowest numbered building. This one's 88, this one that I wanted is 22. So she builds the greenhouse in, in her charter. And she advances the progress track. <clears throat> Now, instead of her getting this, it's going to go to the Advancement Track discard pile. Okay, and it's another building that requires two coal. So that one's really bad for me. This one I could do, but I still need to collect one more metal before I'm able to build it. Okay, now Gladys' turn. On her own plot, she'll occupy the lowest numbered structure and get two victory points. So she's going to the cave, and she gets two victory points. On my turn, I'm gonna buy. I'm gonna buy the refinery. Uh, so I need to go to the market. I spend one dollar and one resource. Uh, it looks like I'm not gonna need any pumpkins. So I'm gonna go to the refinery. I'm gonna trade a dollar and a pumpkin for. Or I'm going to the market. Trade a dollar and a pumpkin for the refinery building card and refill the advancement mat. It's a constructed building, so it's, it's just an open crate. All right, Bertha draws an Automa card. She's gonna roll, go to the lowest number, and get one victory point. On green, one victory point. Gladys, let's see what she's doing. On her own plot, highest numbered two victory points. So on blue, she's gonna bump her own guy off, and she gets two victory points. Now me, I need to go get another metal so that I can build my refinery. Where do I get metal? Right here in the cave. The Gladys is there. Okay, so I can put that off. Okay, the other thing that I want to do is get more dollars to open that crate. So I can go ahead and do that. Let's, let's make sure I save what I need though. I need metal, wood, and clay. So I've got an extra pumpkin and grain. So if I go to the treasury, I can trade my pumpkin for a dollar. Okay, Bertha gathers her workers. Gladys draws a card. She is going to the market where she'll get one victory point and discard the two highest valued cards from the advancement deck. Ah, she bumps off my worker. That's convenient for me. Okay, we've got a 210 and a 208. Those are the two highest values. So those are going to the discard pile and we'll replenish those. Now my turn, I need to collect metal. Okay, I'm gonna sell the grain. So I go to the treasury, bump my own guy off and sell the grain for a dollar. Now I have four dollars, so I'm ready to open the crate. Okay, Bertha's turn, she draws a card. She's gonna roll, take the, occupy the highest valued building and get one victory point. On the yellow charter. And one victory point. Gladys has no workers, she'll collect her workers. Now I need metal, I'm gonna go ahead and gather metal. Bertha draws a card. She's gonna roll, take the second highest valued, and collect one victory point. On yellow, so she'll just bump her own guy off there and get one victory point. Let's see, Gladys. Roll, lowest valued, one victory point. Yellow, she's gonna bump Bertha's guy off. Okay, one victory point. My turn, I have no workers, I gather my workers. Bertha draws an Automa card. She's going to the grandstand, one victory point, a reputation, and a quota. Of 
course. Reputation, quota, and a victory point. She only has two influence tokens left. Okay, Gladys. Charter stone, two victory points, open a crate, increase the progress token. Charter stone, two victory points, open a crate. She takes the lowest value crate, which there's only one anyway, and advance the progress token. So she gets crate six. This is going in the archive. Check the index sheet to see that crate six gives her 109, 110, and 314. And we've got two new building cards and a persona. So the building cards will go in the advancement discard. The persona will go in Gladys's charter chest. Okay, it looks like I'm going to make it. It's my turn. I've got the four resources. And I need three influence tokens. I've still got those. So I'm going to spend three influence tokens. Now in this case, this just goes back to the general supply. And that's the only place that you can regain influence tokens from if, if something lets you regain influence tokens. The one that you've put on the quota or the reputation or the objectives, those are locked for the, for the remainder of the game. So there's my worker on the Zeppelin. I pay three influence tokens, four goods. It has to be specifically the four goods listed on the structure you're building. Two metal, one wood, and a clay. So I take that two metal, a wood, and a clay, and I return it to the general supply. And then I get to construct this building and get five victory points. So I move from 12 to 17. And I get to keep this constructed building card and to open and create 39 whenever I'm able to do so. Also, whenever I use the Zeppelin, I gain two victory points. So from 17 to 19. And since I built a building, I'll move the progress track. And whenever I advance the progress token, I gain one victory point. So from 19 to 20. That was a good turn. All right, I've got $4. The only thing left I need to do is open a crate. And I've actually got two crates to choose from now. But we'll, we'll see. I think I might go with the more basic one just because we're still in game one and I don't know... I know what to expect from it. I don't know what to expect from, from this number 39. All right, but let's try to finish up the game. Bertha. She's going to the grandstand. One victory point, a reputation, and a quota. That's going to end the game real quick. She bumps herself off. She gets a reputation and a quota. See, now she has no influence tokens left. That's going to end the game fast. All right, Gladys has no workers, so she gathers her workers. I have a worker. I need to figure out what I'm trying to do. Uh, if there's anything I need to accomplish still in game one. Yeah, I'm going to open this crate. So two influence tokens. I'll pay these back to the general supply because I'm, I'm sending my worker to the charter stone. And $4.00. which I just happen to have. So I'll pay the $4 back to the supply. Now I get to open a crate and gain five victory points. So I'm gonna give myself those five, so I go from 20 to 25, and open a crate. I'm gonna go ahead and open crate four. So this card, just like the Automas, this goes in the archive. Check the index box, see that crate four gives me cards 73, 74, and 280. All right, so I got these two new building cards that require clay. I've got a kiln and a brick market. The kiln is good for collecting a lot of clay, the brick market for trading your clay for gold and victory points, okay? And a new persona. So uh, the, this persona is gonna go in my charter chest, and these two building cards are gonna go in my player area. And whenever you open a crate, you advance the progress token. All right, that takes us to the end of the track. And when I advance the progress token, I gain a victory point, putting me at 26. And when we're at the end of the track, um, we finish the round so that any, everyone's had the same amount of turns. Gladys went first, which means Bertha will go last. And she has a worker. Now, normally, um, so I have to shuffle the Automa deck. Normally, we would have to advance the progress track because she doesn't have any influence tokens. But there's nowhere to advance it to, so we're just going to shuffle the Automa deck and have her draw her final card. She's going to the market where she gets one victory point and discards the two highest valued cards from the advancement mat. One victory point. 
putting me in last place. And discards, I got a 211 and 213. Alright, so those are getting discarded. There we go. That's the end of the game. Okay, so we had this index card down here. And it says, after game one, extract card 17 from the, from the index, place this card in the archive without removing the sticker. End of game, rule 26. When the progress token advances to the timer space, finish the current round, then the game ends. End game scoring. In player order, gain victory points for reputation and cards with timer icons. Glory. Each player gains glory stars based on their position on the victory point track. Extract card 18 from the index and read before continuing to step 3. Card 18, Glory, Rule 28. Glory is your primary measure of success in your quest for the Forever King to make you the leader of the village. At the end of each game, gain one glory per ten victory points earned that game. Mark those stars on your chart or chest. You choose which stars to fill in. At the beginning of each game, every completed row of glory grants you the listed bonus. Okay, so you get bonuses at the beginning of future games based on which rows of glory you have filled in. And then continue reading the end of game rules which are over here. Alright, so this is rule 28. This will go in my chronicle. And if you look on your charter chest, they're talking about this. So I have 26 victory points. That's two glory. And you see on 10 and 20 and 30, they've put these stars to indicate uh, that you get glory for reaching those levels. Okay, and so the automas do get their glory. They just fill in automatically from the top moving down. But for me, I get to pick where I want to put it, whether I want to gain a resource or a dollar or three victory points at the beginning of each game. Remove one peril token, don't even know what that is yet. Or I can start the game with a reputation if I fill this line up. Uh, minion, don't know what that is yet. Fill in one capacity on your charge, don't know what that is yet. I could gain an advancement card at the start of each game if I fill that up. Or I could select and use an extra persona if I have that one. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to start the game with a resource. Gain victory points for reputation and cards with timer icons. I don't think we have any cards with timer icons. So reputation, Bertha got all the reputation. All of it. So she gets 10 victory points. So she moves up from 27 to 37. And no one was second place because no one else had any reputation at all. Okay, each player gains glory based on their position. So Bertha gets three and myself and Gladys each get two. So this is my glory. I'm gonna go for the resource. So I'm gonna go ahead and give myself two stars. Gladys gets two. The automas just fill in from the top, they don't actually get a benefit from it, and Bertha gets three. For them, it's just worth extra points in the end of campaign scoring, I believe. The player with the most victory points, this game, mark their charter chest with a trophy. Okay, that is Bertha. So Bertha's got trophies over here. Each victory is worth six to eight victory points in a campaign. All right, let's go ahead and give Bertha a trophy for being the most victory points this game. It was really the, the reputation, but she only honestly needed to get one reputation, but she got them all. Okay. Congratulations, Bertha. Non-winners, name your charter. Write it on the board. Also, as a show of humility, each winning charter and inactive charter must now be named by the non-winners. Players will name the village later. Okay, let's name these charters. I will, as a non-winner, start by naming my charter. This charter shall be called Dunder. Alright, Gladys's charter will be called Ilium. And as a loser, I'm going to name Bertha's charter for her. This will be named Vorga. Sharon. Ianosa and so on. All these charter names I came up with are references. I'm not that creative of a person. So are references to stuff that I enjoy. Okay, well Thunder, Thunder's just a reference to the office because that's what I have playing on Netflix at my house every day. But everything else, um, Ilium, Gorga, Sharon, Pianosa, and Soma are all references to Generally sci-fi books from the 50s. I say generally because they're not all sci-fi books and they're not all from the 50s But try to figure out where I came up with those. I know some of those words have been used 
you know, all over the place and many different things. Soma, pretty common word, but I'm, I've got something specific in mind that I pulled it out of, so we'll see. If any of you can figure out where I got these names from, go ahead and guess those in the comments below and I'll let you know if you got it. And uh, bonus points, but the points are made up and mean nothing, so everybody's a winner. Okay, naming is done. Now gather gather all of your player pieces. You will get carry over all components in your personal supply from game one to game two, including coins, resources, cards, etc. Extract card 19 from the index. All right, so this is gonna go on rule 26 in the Chronicle. Card 19, capacity, rule 29. At the end of games two through 12, your capacity will determine the number of components in your personal supply that you may keep. Discard everything else except persona cards and player pieces to the general supply. Your chartered chest shows your current capacity. You start the game with one in each category. Be prepared to only keep one of each after game two. There will be various ways to increase your capacity throughout the campaign. Extract card 20 from the index. Guideposts, rule 27. The wise forever king offers guideposts to steer the village towards success. He still gives players the freedom to choose their path, even if their choice displeases him. Guideposts offer a goal for any number of players to achieve. The current guidepost is kept face up on the board and is processed at the end of the game. Some guideposts have temporary rules for the current game. At the end of the game, any player who achieved the guide who achieved the guide coast, guide post gained one glory. Among those players, the player with the most influence tokens in their personal supply reveals the options on the guidepost. Roll the charter stone to break further ties. That player chooses one of the options and opens the corresponding crate, either Happy King or Angry King. Extract card 21 from the index. Extract card 400, your first guidepost from the index, and read the exposed text. If you're ready to play game 2 now, reset the board and mats of tokens and cards, then return to setup. Stop. Leave this card at the front of the index for the entire campaign. Okay, that concludes game 1 of Charter Stone. Uh, I'm going to have to go ahead and play through a few more games before I give you my review, but I will stop and tell you how I feel about it at this point after game one. Um, so far I really like it. I like the, the sort of cutesy art, the really low-key laid-back feel to this game. I know I'm just playing with the Automas, so it's hard to tell exactly how it'll feel when you're playing against other people, but it seems to me that there's not any take-that mechanics in this game. Now usually in a worker placement game, you can fill a spot and then no one else can take that spot. And sometimes people really want to take that spot, you know, they want to take it, and you fill it just to block them from it, and it's mean. And they might get upset when you ruin their plans like that. In this game, you know, it's, it's, done, it's done backwards. So if someone's already there, you can still go there, but in order to do it, you have to give them a benefit. You have to return their worker to them, which helps them be able to do more before they have to waste a turn gathering their own workers. So your choices in a normal worker placement game, you, you have the option to, to block your opponent, but in this game, you can't do that. You have the option to ignore your opponent or to help them. So I think that makes it a much friendlier game and I'm excited to try it out with different people because of that. Uh, as far as the solo play goes, I'm really enjoying it. I think the the Automa is, is easy enough to handle. Now it does recommend in the rulebook not using Automa for your first game, but if you're playing solo, you have to. So the hardest part about learning this game today was trying to learn how to play my my turns as well as the Automa's turns and there's you know a little difference in the rules and how they go and I had to learn those at the same time and not get them mixed up and so that's why they recommend first learning how to play just with people and then learning how the Automa work after you know how the game works and how a, a real player turn goes but if you're playing solo you don't have that luxury you have to learn both at the same time and be able to keep them separate it wasn't too hard to do but it did take a little more concentration than, than it would if you were just learning how to play without the Automa first. Now, I did get beaten points, but I didn't get beat that bad. Honestly, it wasn't as bad as I thought because I read on the forums when I was, I, when I was looking up how many Automa I should set up for, for a solo campaign, uh, they said, don't be discouraged if you lose terribly in the first couple games to the Automa because it sort of balances out as the campaign progresses. So even though I'm behind after game one, I don't think that's going to be a problem, and I don't know that I'm even really behind anyway. Because, okay, Bertha got the trophy, and Bertha got an extra glory star also, so she's definitely ahead. But me and Gladys are tied in points, you know, because even though she was ahead of me on the victory points track, we both got the same amount of glory. So at the end of the game, I think we, I'm actually ahead because I have extra victory points because I've built an an additional structure in my charter, and Gladys never did that. Also, I'm taking five advancement cards with me into game two, which which is shocking because 
that that's a lot. And it seems like a lot, and it is a lot because for the rest of the game, you have to increase your capacity to take more than one with you into the next game. Uh, it was really interesting how game one played out where Bertha was always doing the reputation track and always filling the quota and spending all of her influence tokens and Gladys never spent any of her influence tokens. She just always opened crates. Uh, it was totally random. It's kind of surprising that it worked out that way. It worked out certainly in my favor because if Gladys had put just one influence token on the rep reputation track, that would have put her in second place for reputation and she would have got seven victory points for that. Speaking of, I could have put one token on the reputation track, come in second place and got seven victory points by doing that. That certainly would have been good. However, I did, by the end of it, I didn't have any turns to spare, right? I just, I got everything done that I wanted to do just in time, just for the end of game one. So, so far, I'm having a great time. I love the art, I love the look of this game on my table. It's just, it's beautiful. All the components feel super premium. All the cardboard's thick, the cards feel like quality cards. You know, the wooden tokens, the, the big wooden die. Metal coins the game came with, metal coins. It just, it feels really nice and really, you know, like they actually put the money into the game. For me, it makes it, it, makes it more fun to play. So I'm gonna go ahead and keep playing. I'll be back later to give you my rating and my final review of Charterstone. Okay, so I played a few more games of Charterstone. Right now I've played five games, so I've gone through game five. So there's 12 games in the campaign, so I haven't finished the campaign yet. I'm going ahead and doing uh, closing out this review because I'm gonna put this back on the shelf for now, but I will be pulling it back out later. One thing I've noticed about this game is I want to finish it. Um, it makes me want to keep coming back to see what's gonna happen next to see how the end of campaign scoring will work and to see how it turns out. So, my review. Uh, what I love about this game, it looks beautiful on the table. That's the, the first and like most important thing to me about why I'm so impressed with this game. The components feel great. They all feel thick and just like good quality components. They feel good in your hand, they look good, they have nice art. I'm a fan of the production of this game. So I did have a couple hangups on this game, some things that kind of detracted from it for me. Uh, first of all, they keep introducing new rules, which is great because when you start the game, you just jump right into playing because there's not very many rules. But it's like game one, game two, game three, game five, even game five, I was just so ready to like play a game. Like I know what's going on, I know how to play this game now, here we go, let's do it, and then psh, new rules. So I have to stop in the middle of the game, you know, read the new rules, figure out what's going on, adjust my strategy. Uh, it's okay, but it's like, I mean, so that does, in one way, that keeps it interesting, but another way, it's like, I thought I knew how to play this game by now, I just wanna play the game. One thing I didn't like, you guys saw me um, having to pull out index cards and read them and go to find specific cards and pull them out. That was not just game one, that keeps happening. Every time someone opens a crate, for example, you have to check what cards you need and pull out all those new cards. And for me, it just kind of like paused the game and slowed it down unnecessarily, especially because the Automas end up opening most of the crates. So I don't really don't care what's in the crate because it's not for me. It just gets added to the to the to the discard pile. So I like the action to keep rolling and opening crates, finding cards in the index, kind of slowed everything down a bit. Um, the other thing that maybe could be a pro, could be a con, hard to say. Um, I never really cared if I was gonna win. I was just kind of playing the game, just just to play the game. Uh, I found it enjoyable, but it, I never felt challenged because I never cared if I won or not because you just, you know, you finish game four, you're moving on to game five. It's not it's not like you have to accomplish something to get there. Uh, so one thing they did do that, that you can challenge yourself with, even if you're just, just playing solo, um, is the Automas have sort of a, a strength value and it starts at, it's one for game one and then game two, it's two. And then it's gonna be two, and, and this is in the rule books, from the beginning, I'm not giving away any spoilers here. It's gonna be two until you beat the Automas, and then it becomes three. And then if you beat them again, it becomes four. And then if you lose by too much, by a certain like uh, you know threshold, it'll drop it back down to three for the next game. So in one way, that's that's a way to challenge yourself to like try to increase the Automas level, you know, because that means that, that you're doing really good at the game. In another sense, it's like, okay, so I, I don't really have to try at all and the Automas will just stay at level two and probably I'll probably win in the campaign, I don't know. Yeah, uh, for the solo game, lack of clear goals and, and competition and challenge, it, a bit of a drawback for the game. So like I said, I was, I'm 
I was kind of annoyed at times with how they kept introducing new rules and you know every single game so far has been different because new things got added but at the same time that's what's making me want to finish the campaign so much I think you know because I've got lots of games where I never finished the campaign but this one I'm, I'm a little burnt out on it now I'm gonna put it up play something else but I think I'm gonna come back to it I think I'm gonna finish the campaign not only that or maybe if I don't finish I do really want to go ahead and restart it um, multiplayer that's something I want to do, although I'm a little worried about having already played myself through game 5, how that's going to affect the multiplayer game. I think it'll give me a bit of an unfair advantage. But it, it's a, it'll be a cute, fun game that I could enjoy with my friends for sure. So that's Charter Stone for me. I'm putting this in my collection and rating it a 7, which for me is, is an above average rating. Uh, what they've done with the legacy aspect of it, uh, it has been done very well. It's very intuitive. It's easy to follow. I never got lost or confused about what I needed to do. And it keeps the game fresh and interesting and changing and different every time you play it. At least for the first, at least for the first five games, that's all I've played. I'll see you next time.